There we go. All right. Hi, everyone. Welcome to another After Hours Animation event. Uh, tonight's event is uh, called Embracing Dissonance, hosted by the incredible Steffi Yi. Thank you so much for taking the time to be here um, and talk with us and she'll share with us. I'm truly so excited. Um, I'm gonna just, before we jump in, I'm just gonna do like a brief intro about our host. So Steffi Yi is an animator, designer, and director working in Sydney, um, unseated, oh, I knew, I, I knew what, there's a name somewhere that was gonna catch me. Um, can you do it for me? Unseated, gotta oh, go. Oh, gotta go land and wanna rural land. So Sydney and the Hunter Valley in Australia. Incredible, thank you so much for doing the land recognition too. Um, okay. Steffi's work weaves together digital and mixed media processes involving stop motion plasticine, ink, pencil, film, and 2D and 3D animation. With a background in music, her animation is driven by the synergy between sound and image. Her work has screened around the world at film festivals, including the Atlanta Film Festival, Melbourne International Film Festival, and Palm Springs Short Fest, where her short film, The Lost Sound, received two nominations for the Best Animated Short and the Best Animated Student Short. Steffi's work has earned features from Vimeo Staff Picks, Motion Grapher, Eon Video, Boom TV, and she's worked on projects for ABC TV and worked on music videos for major artists such as Sam Smith, Pink Panthers, The Free Nationals, Justin Bieber, Toki Mon Monsta, TK, Oh my goodness, I'm really getting hit. Okay. <laughs> You're gonna have to finish the bar. <laughs> <laughs> so, and, and the Naked Famous and more. Um, other clients she's worked with include McDonald's, Warner Music, Red Bull Music, and the University of Technology, Sydney, among others. Thank you so much, Steffi, for being here tonight. And with that, I'll let you take it away. Thanks, McKenna. Um, firstly, I'd like to say thank you, McKenna, for organizing this. This is a really cool initiative. And I watched a bunch of the previous shares and everyone's very amazing. So I'm very honored to be a part of that crew now where I get to share my work with you. Um, so uh, I'm just gonna pull up a presentation. Two seconds. Apologies if my internet is a bit laggy. Can everyone see the presentation? Cool. So my name is Steffi. Um, that's me. I'm an animator, director, um, and I grew up in a small country town in the Hunter Valley in Australia. Um, growing up kind of isolated from the city and from my friends who lived far away, I had to make an effort to find lots of hobbies and just keep myself occupied. So, you know, I would ride the motorbike around on my, in my backyard. Um, I also did a lot of music, drawing, um, watched a lot of TV <laughs> and yeah. So that's me um, playing the piano and that is a painting on the wall that I also painted when I was like seven, I think. Um, so when I was a kid, I really enjoyed playing music and you know, my, my family and my parents, they're all very interested in music as well. So it was always really encouraged. Um, and I also really liked to draw. So as I got older, I realized I could bring the two together and do animation, which is basically sound image. Um, these are some of the things that I was interested in as a kid. It's a bit um, random. So for example, um, in the top corner, that, that's actually a Nickelodeon ident that I found um, really, I guess, they kind of stuck with me. Um, I don't know if anyone's ever seen it. It's, it's by on 
Bonyo, and it's basically like zooming out animation, like a piano riff, which I thought was really cool. Um, also, all of these, I can send you links, we can, and you, if people want to watch, they can watch it just to see like where I draw up my inspiration from. In terms of like embracing dissonance, there's also some Bollywood in here. <laughs> so my family is Chinese and I grew up watching a lot of like Chinese karaoke videos from DVDs and videos that my parents brought back from Malaysia. And some of those were, um, for example, these girls here. I don't know if you can see my cursor or if it's just, um, yeah. So this child girl group here was a big inspiration for me. Um, yeah. And also this, um, this movie, it's called Cubby Pushy Cubby Gum. That was a big influence for me as well. So a lot of music driven um, inspirations. Also Missy Elliott, um, Work It, it's a great video. This video called Drop by Farside. Um, by Spike Jones. So it's basically a video of them performing their track, but it's all in reverse. So they've had to lip sync it in reverse. Um, and it's a really cool video. Some other inspirations include the distillers. So I went through a bit of a punk phase. Um, I really look up to Brody. I think she's really cool. And at the time there weren't many female or female identifying artists. So um, yeah, that was an inspiration for me. Video Hits, which is an Australian music video TV program. So kind of like MTV, but it's a TV show. Um, my mom used to tape the, the episodes um, every weekend. And we just, my siblings and I would just watch the videos over and over again. So we watched a lot of music videos growing up. Rage is another one. That's another music video program in Australia. Um, down the bottom here, we have My Moon, My Man by Feist. So that's a great video that has really inspired me as well. Another one is It's Like That by Run DMC. I remember watching that as a kid on Video Hits and Rage, and it really had an impact on me. Um, hey Arnold is another one. I love the music in Hey Arnold. It's by Jim Lang. Um, it's very emotive and jazzy. So that had a big um, impact on how I see animation um, as I guess like an art form because Hey Arnold is quite mature in terms of the themes that they deal with. And it's the same with the music. Um, I also went through a prog phase and I was really into the Mars Volta. So that's another video up here. Um, that's the video for Goliath. <laughs> and over here we have the Chemical Brothers. So Let Forever Be and Star Guitar. So I really love Michelle Gondry as a director. He works a lot with experimental film and animation and um, I guess emphasizes its relationship with music. Um, I can link some things from him later on. And down the bottom here, we have Kylie Minogue, who was also a big inspiration for me growing up. Um, yeah, she's a bit of a chameleon and can do any genre, in my opinion. So I guess the main thread here is um, a lot of my inspirations from when I was a kid evolved around music. And that was the main driver for me to do animation actually, because I, I started out in graphic design and I realized very quickly that the part that was missing for me was the sound element. And that was when I transitioned to animation so that I could explore the relationship between sound and music. So this is some of my work. Um, a question I get asked a lot is what is your animation style? Uh, I don't know. Uh, I guess I've had to think about this and I, I think my approach to animation isn't necessarily about figuring out a style that's representative, representative of me. Um, it's more about exploring how I react to sound and music. 
so I guess animation is like a vehicle for me to express how I, I react to sound. Um, and that can come out in lots of different ways and different styles. So for example, <clears throat> for example here, this is 2D animated. This is a video I did for the artist Anomaly Emesego. Um, that's all 2D illustrated and animated frame by frame. Down here we have a video that I did for Pink Panther S. Um, I did a bit of 3D modeling here. Uh, there's also a bit of video editing. Down the bottom, we have the lost sound, my stop motion short film. Um, and up here, we have Recovered by the Naked and Famous. So in this video, I was, I worked on it with a friend of mine, Eva Lee. Um, so we were given a piece of footage and we were told to animate on top of it. And so I kind of explored motion tracking here and mixed media processes. Down here, we have something a bit more traditional as well. So this is Kita Alexander, who's an Australian artist. Um, I did the visualizer for her and yeah, this is also frame by frame. And over on the right, we have a project of mine called Well Learned Corporations. And this one is also very different. This is more in the style of like motion design. Um, so the process behind this short interactive film, um, which hasn't been released, it's, it's kind of like an event you have to go to, but we want to release it at some point. Um, basically, when I was approached to work on it with a friend who's a composer, she had already written the entire score for the film. And the film is driven by narration and sound design. So the animation actually came afterwards. So that initially the whole film worked as a standalone sound design piece and it still made sense. So that was an interesting process because the animation was complementary to the sound. Whereas I think in most projects, it's the other way around. Um, so yeah, I guess the common thread here again is that everything is driven by sound and yeah, it doesn't necessarily dictate my style because I react differently to different sounds and music. Um, this is something that I was a bit self-conscious about early on when I was studying. I think there's a tendency to ask people straight up what their animation style is. And if you don't have one, then maybe there's something wrong with you. Um, but I think it's, it's cool to explore different things and try different processes. I don't think there's any shame in that. And it's interesting because, you know, when you hear musicians talk about their work, they always talk about how um, they don't want to like make the same album twice or something like that. And I think that mentality could apply more to the visual arts as well. Um, and while I do really love and respect people who like can really hone in on one style and refine it so that's distinctly them, like I don't think I could ever do that. Um, and I've kind of come to terms with that. So if you're in the same boat, I don't think there's an issue if you, you have like several different styles. It's fun to experiment. So yeah. Um, I'm gonna go into some projects that I've worked on. So this is a recent one. Um, it's a music video for the track Memory Leaves by Anomaly and the Sago. So they came to me with a narrative about a father and daughter relationship where the father is a musician and he's always touring and he doesn't get to spend time with his daughter. And, you know, we see that time passes by and he's always out working and playing gigs and stuff. And then later on we jump ahead and then we realize that she, the daughter also becomes a musician. So she, they kind of swap roles and she's always out touring. So it's a bit, um, a bit of a sad story really, but it's also very because there's, there's a nice relationship between the father and daughter because they're both musicians. Um, I'm gonna play you a little preview right now, so. I don't know if you could 
hear that? Was there audio? There was. It's a little laggy. Okay. Just the visuals. <laughs> Hang on. So um, the way I approached the project, um, as everyone knows, animation, it's a lot of work to animate narrative and character. So the way I, I managed that was I kind of broke down the musical structure of the song. Um, and basically in each part of the song, I put a variation on the scenery. So for example, you know, throughout the track, the plants start growing. Um, there's a theme of like a hopscotch and over time it fades. There's also an aeroplane and over time, you know, the time of day changes. And um, we've also got this phone here where it's more obvious, like the time changes on the phone. And here there's like also different times of day. Um, yeah, so for example, here with the planes. So the, the first one is like the first verse and then you got the second verse, third verse. Here you got like the middle eight and then the ending. So they're all variations on one theme, which is also a principle in music. So I think, yeah, I, a lot of the time I turn to the structure of the music or the sound in order to dictate how I approach the animation and how I break it down. So that's an example of, I guess, um, how I use sound as a tool for my animation. So this is another project of mine. This was one of the first Strata Cut projects I worked on. And it was based on a bunch of dreams that I wrote down in a diary from when I was a teenager. Um, and I, I have a friend who's a, a composer and she basically composed the soundtrack and I kind of worked with her um, right from the, from the beginning. So rather than animating everything and then getting someone to make sound for, for it, I had sound in mind already. Um, so I'm gonna play a video for you so you get to see. That's what I'm talking about. Sorry, I think you can see that in a second. Can everyone see Vimeo? Yep. Hang on, just trying to find my window. Okay, we're back. So this was a really stressful project because I'd never done Strata Cut before. Um, so this was the first test I did. This is actually a different eyeball to the one here. This is the initial eyeball, the first eyeball I made as a test. Um, the way, I guess, that it moves, you can kind of see the interior here. Sorry, it's a blurry photo. This is like back in 2010 or something. <laughs> um, 
So that's the interior of the eye. And this is, I'm gonna show you another video here. So this was the first test I ever did with Shrata Cut. Um, yeah, so that was shot on my HTC phone at the time. Um, I kind of just like propped it up with some plasticine on a table because I didn't have a tripod and I just shot that as a test. Um, and to my surprise, it kind of worked. So I, I, it gave me a bit of inspiration to make Dream Diary, which is film. Um, whoops. Yeah, so I'm gonna show you a bit of my process. Hang on, my mouse is very sensitive. So this is the sculpture that you just saw animated in Dream Diary. These are the mounds. I'm not sure if you remember um, in the short. Let me have a look. I'm just gonna show you again so that I can explain it and it'll make sense. So this map here. This is a dream I had about a choir. So a bunch of people singing in a choir. <laughs> so I just made a bunch of mouths singing in harmony. Um, this like um, chevron black and white pattern is actually green screened. So I, I actually had a mouth chomping onto a green block of plasticine that I just keyed a pattern into. So I didn't have to like waste my effort on making a pattern if, in case it didn't work when I, when I sliced it open. Um, feel free to ask questions by the way, because I don't know if I'm explaining it very well, because it's a bit confusing um, to explain. <laughs> So that Matthew just saw, this is what I do at the beginning, usually before I start constructing the block. So I plan it out, um, you know, how much plasticine do I need? How long the sculpture will be? How much it'll cost? And if I need to cut down on the scale of the sculpture, um, in order to cut down costs of plasticine. So this is where the camera is. It's facing the front. This block here was that green screen I was talking about. It's basically just a, um, it's green plasticine. And here you see the lips kind of wrap around the green screen as if it's like chomping down on it. I added a bit of anticipation here um, as the mouth opened, or I tried to. Um, and the way I did that was I kind of just imagined it vertically, like, you know, when, when the mouth opens, it kind of goes down and back down when it chomps down on the green screen. Um, and obviously as the teeth, Chomp down, the mouth widens because you know um, that's what happens when you when you bite down. So I kind of like mapped out what that would look like as well and measured it out horizontally. Um, here, zoom in actually. I don't know if you can do that. So that black line there, those are the lips. 
And then there's a little white line inside there. Those are the teeth. Actually, I'm gonna show you if I disappear out of frame, it's not because I'm gone. I'm just grabbing stuff that's around me. So this is one of the sculptures here. Um, it's a bit dusty. This is 10 years old. Oh wait, no, it's eight years old. Um, so this is the mouth that you saw in the film. So what I've done, basically the way that I constructed this was I, I constructed the teeth first. Um, so each tooth was a white long strip. I put gray in between each tooth to outline the teeth. And then I filled the edges with black um, as if it's like the inside of the mouth wrapped it in black again um, and the way that I get this part so thin is I use I use a pasta roller to thin it out and then with the lips I, I could have just used like a plain red um, color but I wanted a bit more movement so what I did is I got a bit of ink and I just blended it in with the red so that when it's moving there's still a bit of movement even in the, the parts that aren't part of the main animation um, and then to I guess highlight the entire thing I put another black outline around everything so I just covered everything with a shade of black um, and then in terms of slicing, when you slice the block, the knife tends to push down on the sculpture and it can squash the image sometimes. So what I did to kind of um, give this a bit more structure so that I wouldn't get squashed, I made these little like triangles at the bottom, black support triangles. And I, I should have said this at the beginning, but um, I have to credit David Daniels who, has made a bunch of Stratocut tutorials on YouTube. Um, I just watched a bunch of these tutorials and learned from him basically. Um, so yeah, if you, if you get the chance, go and check out his stuff. He's like the original plasticine Stratocut person to go to. So yeah, that's, that's one of the blocks. I've got more, so I'll be back. Another one here. Um, I'm gonna go back to the diagram and explain. Sorry, I'm just trying to decode what I've written. Oh yeah, I'm gonna go down the bottom here. So there's a lot of measuring involved. Um, what I, the way I measured it was five millimeters per frame of animation. So if I was working in 24 frames um, per second, it would be 24 times five millimeters, which I think is around 12 centimeters. Um, so yeah, I just kind of calculated how many frames things would go for and how long they would be. I made an animatic for this one digitally. Um, I kind of just, I had the soundtrack already and I just timed out different parts, different sections of the animation, just to get a feel for how, how long in duration there were so I could calculate how long the sculpture would be. Um, there's some calculations down here that I did as well. So this is the sculpture here. Oops. Hang on, I think it's frozen. Um, 
Um, yeah, so this is a sculpture. Similar idea as the book before, except this part doesn't have teeth. So here, I kind of just added these spirals for decoration. Um, I don't have a full, full sculpture of this to show, but the way I, I created these patterns, what they do is they, they kind of like move out. So what I did was I got, I made them into cones. So as you cut down, the colors shrink. Oh no, they actually expand. It would have been cones coming out this way and you're slicing it this way. So they start out small and then they get bigger and bigger and bigger and then disappear. So if you watch the animation, which is online, um, you'll be able to see that play out. And this is the green screen I was talking about earlier. So the mouth actually chomps down onto green instead of the black and white pattern. Um, and in terms of like saving money and plasticine, this is also very useful because once this is sliced, I can just take the green out and reuse it for something else. Oops. Okay. So that was my first project using Stratica animation. This is what it kind of led to. Um, which is the left sound. Um, and this is like a half strata cut and half 2D animation. Most of it was under the camera. Um, and it was based on a poem by Hiromi Ito, Ito um, from a book called Killing Tanako. So the poem is about um, the loss of language, which is something I really identified with. Um, as an Australian born Chinese Malaysian person, you know, there's dialects, like the dialect that my parents speak, it's, it's a dying language. Um, and it kind of, yeah, this, this poem really spoke to me because it talks about how the loss of language can, can divide people and families. Um, basically, it's about a woman who can't communicate with her elders. Um, I'm going to show you the film. Sorry, it's a bit laggy, so I'm just going to wait. Steffi, sometimes it works better if we send a link. Is there a public link to this film and then people can watch it on their end? It might be less laggy. It's okay if there's not. Yeah, yeah sure. Um, this is on Vimeo. Did you want to watch it now or you can just watch it later? Oh, were you planning on screening it now? Oh, yeah. It's only about two minutes. So I don't know. It might put into context um, Definitely. some of the stuff. Okay, cool. I'll, I'll show it then. Oh. I'll send you a bunch of links after this as well so people can revisit it. Amazing. All right, we're on Vimeo. ウィンあ<音楽> 
両親を震わせる虫の家のようなかすれた息こう言ってくださいよ違う違う違う違う違う違うこうよ引き分けることはできてもを発音することは私にはできない。So that was the film.、Um, yeah, so that, that's the book that I was, the poem is from.、Um, it's really great.、Um, yeah. There's a bunch of, it's a, it's a collection of poems written by the author, and that was one of them in there. So this is the process. Of making the title sequence. Similar process to the teeth. I'm actually going to grab the box. I've got them here. This is the, the model. Pretty big. It's hard to slice because it's really.、Um, I mean, it's really hard to slice because of its hard plasticine. <laughs>、um, basically, the way that I made this was I created each letter form first. So that's the first thing I did.、Um, you can see that I've got an E here. I made all the letter forms. Here and I wrapped them, I guess, in some like support、um, clay. And I just kept building around it into a brick, like a rectangle. These characters here were a little challenging because there's a lot of curves.、Um, the way that I approached that was I sculpted the negative space first. So, for example, this character here, I sculpted that shape and then this little like round bit here. And then I kind of wrapped the white strips around it to get that definition.、Um, and those are the slices. And in terms of the patterns that move around the text,、um, you can see that they're on a diagonal. So, the way that they move is because of how, how on an angle the stripes are.、Um, I don't know if that makes any sense. Basically, I've angled them so that when you cut through, they, they start moving. So, a big part of the film is the sound and music design. Once again, the sound actually. Like a lot of the, the sound and music came first, and the ideas came first. So, I, rather than going into the project thinking about how I would animate it, I actually came up with the soundscape first.、Um, and I wanted a lot of it to be like spoken and like vocal because of the theme of language in the, in the poem.、Um, So, yeah, Amy McNichol wrote the, the melody that you hear in the, the film, and Donnie Jenks did a lot of the sound design, but also wrote the, the trailer、um, and credits music. And he did a lot of the like,、um, like layered experimental vocal work, and also the sound, sound effects.、Um, in terms of the animation process, So, this is really interesting because、um, at the time, 
I was using a brand of plasticine that you could melt um, on the on the double boiler, double boiler. So that's on a stove. But that brand of plasticine has been discontinued. So I'm not sure if this is even doable anymore. Um, melting the colors together and then having them solidify to reuse them. I have a different brand of plasticine now, but I, I haven't tried it with that yet, but I'm not sure if it'll work because it's a bit softer. So it might just like split or something. Um, there's a bit here about David Daniels, who again, you should look up. So here there's some of the patterns that I made. Um, so this, this line or sculpture here is what you see in the beginning with those um, patterns in the intro. This I didn't end up using this red stripey one because I, I kind of just got some scraps and put them together to see if they would animate, but they didn't really, I just cut like sliced it up and didn't really do anything. Um, there's more here as well. I posted a bunch of these on Instagram. So if you wanna see them moving in, in motion, um, you can just look on my Instagram. So this section is the mother's mouse. So you've got my mother, my mother's older sister, I think it is. My mother's younger sister and my grandmother. Um, so that's the transition between each block. I don't know if you can see here. Can I zoom in? So I've got, I usually work with this chart. Um, I don't know why I ruled it by hand. I could have just done it on Illustrator or Photoshop or something, but I didn't realize that until afterwards. So I actually like drew all these lines um, and measurements. So that's to kind of mark out, I guess you could say keyframes. So for example, I actually had an animatic for this as well. So I, I knew how long each section was going to go for. So I would calculate those frames into measurements and then mark it out on the chart so that I knew how long to make each section. Um, and it also just helps with like, if I'm working on this sculpture and I come back tomorrow and I've forgotten what I've done, I've got markers here to tell me what's what. Um, there's another look at how the chart looks. This is one of the 2D animated sections. So this was done uh, on paper and shot um, and colored by Jessica Edge, who was very helpful in the film. Um, I, I just animated this on Adobe Animate and then printed out the, the, the frames and did them on paper, like colored them and drew them on paper. I might go here first. Oh, well, actually. Yeah. So this is one of the, the main blocks in the film that was a lot of work to do. Um, because there's a lot of components. So there's you get the eyeball, the mouth, the whole shape of the block that needs to move a specific way. And also the eyelashes actually flutter and like um, move around the eyeball. Um, and you can see how I've planned it here. So this is the side view of the block, basically. Like the, the lips are together and they open and they close and they're meant to like blow out patterns. I don't know if that comes across in the final thing, but you know, something's happening in there. Um, this is kind of like a pre-visualization of how the block would look. Um, the hair actually moves as well. So it's wavy hair that kind of like 
moves downwards. Here I've calculated, you know, how many frames each keyframe would be. Um, and yeah, just some brainstorming down here. This little block here was a test for the, the main block. So I kind of like scaled it down into a, a smaller sized block to map out the timing. So you can see that here. So it's, yeah, basically the same animation, but yeah, I, I kind of built it from here. It's mainly the lips that are, the, the animated lips that I'm pre-visualizing here. So here's more of the block. So you can see here that the lips close and they open and they close again. Um, I wrapped it in brown sheets as well to kind of like outline the face so that there's distinction between the face and the background and the hair. And this is the hair here. So the hair actually kind of like moves downwards in the animation. Here's more of the finished block. I really like how the eyeball kind of like smears in the eyelashes. I think that's, yeah, the part that I really like about shortcut animation is that everything's kind of been perfect and you don't really know what you're gonna get. And here is like, yeah, all the, all the blocks from the film, all the slices. Um, yeah. Thank you. I'm gonna do a demonstration after this. So if anyone has any questions in the meantime, feel free to ask them. This has been incredible. Thank you so much. If you have questions, like please feel free to unmute or like pop them in the chat and I'll read them out. Um, so one question as you get set up, um, Sam asked, is it baked clay, raw or soft? Uh, it's it's oil-based plasticine, so it doesn't dry out and you also don't need to bake it. And I have to ask while you're while you're cutting it, like I, I love to see, thank you for letting us see your process because that was so interesting. Um, but like you must have to be so exact with your knife. Like you must have to have like a good knife or like, cause I can see it would be so easy to apply too much pressure to the left or the right. And you, you don't get a straight, a straight cut. Yeah, that's true. Um, I think the hardest one was that the title sequence is this one here. Because each slice was bigger than my knife. So my knife, you know, if it's, if it's a small block, my knife kind of does the work for me. It just like slices down. But this one I had to control where the knife is going. Mm -hmm. So this sequence was actually like a few frames too short. So I stuffed mm -hmm. up this one and I had to like tweak it to like extend it out. Wow. Um, but yeah, it can get a bit tricky, but the knife, the knives I usually use, they're blunt knives because I, I don't want to cut myself because it, it can slip sometimes. Right. Um, yeah. So they don't have to be sharp. Wow. Yeah. I'm still just setting up. Yeah, yeah. Take your time. Does anyone else have any questions in the meantime? Has anyone tried to try a cut before? I guess it's a no. <laughs> Maybe now. Maybe now they will. <laughs> we have one more question. Um, 
Sylvia asks, how long does it usually take to animate or as well to make the sculptures? Um, it depends. So um, today I'm going to make one that's just an experimental pattern. So if it's a pattern, you can kind of get away with like things that aren't exact. But with that head sculpture, for example, um, that one was really hard because it's obviously a person and it's got to move a certain way. So I had to map out a bunch of different things within that sculpture. So that took maybe, I don't know, four weeks. But a lot of the time, it I just it took a long time because I just didn't want to slice into it. And I just sit there like thinking about it <laughs> and trying to make sure that everything was okay before I sliced into it. Amazing, thank you. I'm gonna show you another video now. This is kind of what we're gonna do in my demonstration. So I'm gonna make something similar to this today. Did everyone see that? Cool. Feel free to ask me questions while I am. Um, construct the sculpture. So uh, I guess I'll I'll keep it I'll keep it going. And one of my questions was um like following the lost sound, have you found that you have a lot of um strata cut commissions or people asking you to kind of continue within the medium? Because I know, uh, like personally, my experience with Stratocut has been like fairly limited unless I have someone who's like really interested in, in it. Like you don't come across it as much within like the experimental realm. Um, so I was wondering what your experience has been with that and continuing to make like Stratocut work since then. It's interesting because I, so when I made Dream Diary, which was the first project I worked on, I actually stopped after that for a few years because I, I kind of thought no one's going to ever hire me for something like this. It's too weird. <laughs> um, but then I, I was encouraged to revisit Stratocut by friends and tutors and stuff when I was studying. So that's why I made The Lost Sound. Um, and again, when I made it, I was like, this is just like a passion project. No one's ever going to hire me for this. But strangely enough, people have hired me based on that, um, but for different work. Okay. And I, I, it must have something to do with like, I don't know, just something to do with ideas, I guess. Like maybe it says something about the way you approach animation, like you're just willing to try stuff. So mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't necessarily get hired for strata cut, but I do get approached to like come up with ideas. Um, I don't know if that makes any sense, but I would like yeah. to do more strata cut. Yeah. No, that, that definitely makes sense. And I think that's like a common theme. I know, I think also when Jamie Wolf came to talk, she was saying, well, once they saw that I had ideas, they didn't really care like what, you know, they, it was more just coming because um, there's like a, a creativity exhibited there. Um, and I know just like from reading some of the captions on your posts about the lost sound, um, how like this, you were almost surprised as well by the, the response or it sounded like you weren't expecting that large of a response because I know the film was widely adored. Um, and like, I think it's so interesting how um, and it's a great example, especially for people who feel like there's too many limitations to animation to just do it and like without the expectations of what should come with it or success or whatever that means to each individual filmmaker, but to just make the work and put your heart and soul into it because you when you watch your film, it's very clear how much you brought of yourself into it and how much love and passion went into it. And I think that speaks for itself, you know. Yeah, that's true. I think, yeah, everyone should just try stuff that they haven't tried before and just see what happens. 
basically my like um mentality is just seeing what I can get away with (laughs) (laughs) and then that kind of puts you in a place where you just try stuff (laughs) um I'm gonna mirror my phone so you can see what I'm doing Sorry, this is tricky. Oh, good. As you're getting set up, there's another question in the chat. Um, Emily asks, do you still play music? Do you find any part of the process of animating similar to that of making and playing music? Yeah, I do. Um, I find it very similar, actually. So, for example, with the the strata cut stuff, those diagrams I showed, they kind of remind me of, like, um, reading music, like, on a, on a staff. Um, I used to study music in school, and we had to draw... Um, like we did contour drawing of music. So for example, they would isolate like a principle of music, like the pitch or something, or the dynamics. And then you'd have to draw what it was doing in the in the music. So if something was going up in pitch, you'd, you'd draw upwards. And then if it went back down, you'd draw down. For some reason that like really aligns with how I think about Shutter Cut because it's kind of um, an extrusion of time in a sense and like a visual representation of what's happening throughout time. Um, Yeah, I I would like to play more music. Um, I just don't really like sitting down that much these days because I'm always at a desk. (laughs) And yeah, music requires me to to sit down. (laughs) But yeah, I would would love to like get back into it um, the way I was into it as a teenager. But as an adult, it's a bit harder now. Yeah, I'll, I'll show you what I'm doing, by the way. Can everyone see this? I can, yes. Yeah, so I've made a bunch of these. Um, let me know if it's laggy as well. No, I think I it's good. I, cool. So basically what I've done is I've made a bunch of these blue strips and I've wrapped them in black as like an outline. Um, I'm going to show you this thing as well. I use, um, this is a plasticine extruder. I'll put it here so you can see it. I do is I feed plasticine into it. See. So I get these thin strips. which I can then use to wrap these blue strips with to outline it. Just move this out of the way so you can see it. Show you my knives. He's a blunt knife. Um, this corner was 
really sharp, so I just taped it up so that I don't have it myself. Yeah, use blunt knives if you want to try to cut because yeah, it's it's just it still works. It doesn't need to be sharp. So what I'm gonna do is wrap this blue strip. And I just clean up the edges here because they're a bit, um, you can see, they're a bit raggedy. And I want an even outline. So if I, I don't want to overlap any of the black because I want a certain thickness in terms of the outline. And I've set the, the extruder on like a number three, which is like the thickness setting. And these are just scrap pieces of plasticine from past films that I've made and experiments that I've done. And I tend to pull the sculptures apart to reuse some of the plasticine so that I don't have to buy more. Also, I didn't mention, um, so this title sequence here is the block is green, but in the film it's pink. And the reason for that is I had a surplus of green plasticine um, and I didn't want to spend more money on buying pink plasticine. So I just changed the hue of it <laughs> in the film. So yeah, that's something that I tend to do as well to keep it economical. So here, I'm going to wrap this now. there's anyone in Sydney from this call um, but some of my strata cut sculptures are on display at the Japan Foundation in Sydney right now so you can go and check those out and it's in a group exhibition with a bunch of other animators from Japan and also Australia, a lot of First Nations animators, and it's a lot of mixed media work. So there's a bunch of screenings, but also the sculptures and sketches behind the films. It's a great exhibition. You should go check it out if you're interested. Okay, here we go. That's how it looks. So now I've got a bunch of these strips. What I want them to do is basically like that video I showed you earlier where some of the circles go in one direction and some of them go in the other direction. And I'll show you how I do that. So basically, move to go out of the way. This camera's over here. Let's say I make a block like this. Maybe a small. Let's say we slice it this way, straight on. It's not going to animate because it'll just keep going straight down. Um, so what we want to do 
Let's turn it on an angle. So if we and if we slice for this now, then those circles are going to pan across to this side. So they're just going to go from here to here. So that's something I um, have to think about whenever I'm animating Stratica. And you can, the more of an angle it's on, the faster it's going to pan across. That makes sense. So we want two directions of panning. So what I'm going to do I'll have to face it towards me so that I can see what I'm doing. I'm just cutting it to even it out. I'm gonna have some water. So I'm just gonna draw a line so that I can visualize where I'm gonna slice. I don't know if you can see that. So that's kind of where I'm gonna cut. So cut off that front bit. And this is how it looks now. This way. Sorry, I'm confused about where my camera is. So they're gonna move in that direction. And I want I'm going to make more of that move in the other direction. Like this. So that these ones will pan across and these ones will pan across this way. I'm just squaring it all. Now I've got this corner. Now it looks like this. Oops. So what I did was I, initially it was like this, like one long, Strip, and I just cut it off, and then now I'm going to move that over here. So now we're starting to see the the shape of the block forming. It's amazing watching you do that because my brain wouldn't have been able to figure that out. <laughs> I was like, I don't know how she's going to do this. Like, it's it's so interesting to watch. Um, well, what I'm going to do next is cut this bit off, and then. Basically, I don't really know what's going to happen when I cut this. I just cut it and then see if I can put it somewhere. <laughs> That's my, um, how I work. I don't actually know what's going to happen. I just do it and then see what happens. So now I can put that here. I mean, it's really small. I don't need that. And it doesn't have to be perfect. Like, I'm just going to, like, mash these ones together and you won't be able to tell because it's like one little part of the animation where there's a sink
I'll try to do this one handed so you can see. I'll measure this just to see how long it is. Just like a puzzle, trying to figure out where these like straight edges could go. Just getting it to tessellate. There's our first layer done. This is the panning to the left layer. Now we're going to do the right, panning to the right. Maybe I'll make this one a bit faster so you can see the difference. So see how um, this angle, like this is on an angle. I'm gonna make this one an even, uh, what do you call it? Harsher angle. It's gonna move to the right even faster than this is gonna move to the left. My arm's getting sore, so I'm just gonna put this down. <laughs> yeah, don't don't worry, you can keep it down. I think it okay. was great to see the first time, but I will let you power through it now. Earlier, you were talking about how you you made an animatic and had everything like very um, carefully timed out. And I have to ask, like, with this medium being so malleable, like, how much of it was like? Did you have find like either happy accidents or like sad accidents, or you know, along the way? Um, my math is not that great, so I actually for the. For a lot of the sequences, I ended up making too many frames. So it was like twice the duration that I wanted. Because obviously in, in like, I don't know, traditionally you animate in twos. I calculated it in ones. So I had this really long, slow animation. So I had to cut out every second frame. So I actually did more work than I had to. But in a way it's kind of good because I had um, extra frames in case anything was wrong. Like it's better to have more frames than not enough. Um, yeah, mainly the, the animatic stuff is just to calculate how much plasticine I need. So that I can, like, I'll know, I know how to sculpt it. Mm -hmm. Cause yeah, it's never gonna really come out exactly the way you plan it. That's kind of the fun of it. I think the craziest thing about Stratacut for me is like being able to visualize the the in-betweens and the frames like as you're working. Like you have to know what that 
frame of like the eye almost closed looks like, which is one thing, but then to make it with clay in one cohesive piece with the connected to the part that is open, it sounds like such a big, uh, big challenge. So it's really fascinating watching you do this now because I can see how it's like how the shape takes form. Um, and you're almost like setting yeah. up the boundaries for your frames too in terms of size. Yeah, that's true. Um, there's a lot of guessing, I guess. Um, and just like doing stuff to see what happens. That animation of the woman's head was really stressful because I, it's quite a large block. I don't think I have any um, of the sculpture here, but that was maybe, I don't know how big to describe it. Um, maybe like the size of an A4 sheet of paper. Mm -hmm. So it was very heavy and a lot of plasticine and I didn't want it to go to waste. That was stressful. Yeah, I can imagine. Wow. I might see if I can do another layer. Maybe. I'm just gonna stack it so that it's not just like two layers of patterns. We have like four now. Sorry if this is boring, I'm just thinking. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry. I do want to just flag. I just want to be a little mindful of the time just because I know sometimes around the hour and a half mark is when people normally have to run. Um, yes. So I don't want to rush you, but I just wanted to let you know. All right. Uh, we're getting oh. comments in the chat. People are people are happy to watch. It's very meditative. <laughs> really? <laughs> I guess it is a bit of an ASMR. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's also like watching someone solve a, a puzzle that you're not sure you understand yourself. So it's, it's interesting in that regard too. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, David Daniels, the guy who I was talking about earlier, his video is a very meditative because he's, I don't know. The way he thinks is like, I don't understand how he thinks. So it's just amazing to see how he solves problems. Making sure that they're alternating directions.
Nearly done. Just gonna fill this gap. There might be some imperfections in this, but we'll see how they look. Doesn't really matter. Amazing. Okay. I'm using the app. Stop motion. I think it's called stop motion studio or stop motion. Um, I haven't really used it before, but it seems pretty straightforward. I did a test and it, it seemed fine. So that's what I'm doing today. Um, it's a great resource for those who are looking to try. I know I've, I've yeah. used it briefly too. It's awesome. It's pretty good because you can just like slide through and play back. I'm just using this piece of plasticine as a weight to hold this down. So I'm going to start slicing through this. Just make sure it's the right way. I'm just gonna draw a line. Now I usually mark out where I want to move it. Because I slice it and then I move it forward and slice and move it forward. I just have a little line at the front. Or well, sometimes I have some like a piece of paper and I drag it along. Mm. But for today I'm using a line. And I recently bought a camera slider, which I haven't used yet, but I think that'll be fun to try and use with charter cut. Okay. I'm going to start shooting. I'm just going to do a test and see. Oh, this is a test I did yesterday just to get used to the the app um, it's very subtle but you can see how the lines like move across wow yeah. all right first slice I'm going to go for like a three millimeter slice. It's satisfying because it's always very clean. Maybe I'll put this there. And then I'm just going to move this up. Again. I didn't take a photo. Whoops. Okay. 
you can see how the, the circles that were angled more are longer because they're on a different angle. And it's kind of because it look, they're moving faster too. So they actually look like animation smears. It's quite wonderful how the black around the shapes you made also adds to the texture and the animation. Yeah. It's a good, easy trick because it kind of highlights the shapes. I'm just going to have a look at what I've shot just to see if it's working. Maybe I'm moving the thing too much. I'm just going to grab something else. Wait, no. That's a bit more stable. I'm going to switch to a large knife and see if it's easier. Sometimes I like don't slice it properly and it looks like this. That's fine. Also, sometimes I, um, I've had blocks where I'm moving it and then it starts sliding across. So I have to go back in and after effects and line everything up. That's a pain, but it happens. Check. Yeah, you can see it's sliding across here as well. That's okay.
Maybe this could be time lapse. I think this is definitely sliding across the, the frame, but that's okay. You can still see how it moves. So the last slice is always hard because it, it's so thin. Revolve. So I don't know how to set the frame rate. Oh, I think in the Yeah, that's how it looks. You can see how the, the longer ones are moving much faster than the circles. That's amazing. Yeah. You grow my slices, so I keep the ones that look cool. These ones I might reuse for something else. Very cool. Thank you. Very, very well. Yeah, there's a, that's basically like the, the main principles of Stratocut is like knowing which direction things go in and how fast. Amazing. Yeah. Thank you so much for going through that with us. It's so fascinating to get to see the behind the scenes and your process. Um, that's okay. And it's like beautiful to see the movement, like as you're working, like also it's super relaxing to watch. Um, it must be like kind of frantic to like cut away at your frames in a way. It's such a different process of creating each frame, but it's it's really incredible to see. Thanks. I'm glad you enjoyed it. <laughs> if there's any questions, like please pop them in the chat. We'll take maybe a couple more minutes and then, um, yeah. Well, I hope you send, um, if you can send me the, the little clip, even if it's moving to the side, it, it'll be great to see and share, share with like the rest of the community as well. Yeah, sure. I'll save it in case I delete it. I get that saved. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Well, this has been amazing. Like, thank you again. Thank you so much for taking the time. Like, I'm very grateful. It was lovely to hear about your inspiration and to see your process. And like, um, it's always so inspiring to hear someone say, well, I don't really have like a set style. Um, but like, and like, and, and that's like something that's like liberating and inspiring as well. And I think a great way to like approach animation, like that's how I feel too. So it's, um, nice to hear from someone that you admire but yeah if there's no other questions um we'll call it an evening thanks for 
your your patience watching me slice that. <laughs> oh, it was relaxing after a long day of work. I'm like, I was like almost like falling, falling, not falling asleep, but like I can feel my body like re relaxing a little oh. bit. I'm like, okay, this is good. This is what I needed. <laughs> Maybe you should make more of these videos then. <laughs> yes, definitely. I was like, this is something I would watch on like Twitch or something, like late night <laughs> streaming. Like you should look into that because I would yeah, definitely, maybe I will. <laughs> definitely <laughs> watch <practice>. this. <laughs> Amazing. Well, thank you so much, Steffi. Thank you to everyone who came out tonight. It's been amazing. And yeah, can't wait to see what you make next. Thank you. Thanks for having me. And thanks for watching. Of course.